Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be here today. I'd like to thank all the people involved in organizing this workshop. I'm Osam Komiyama, Vice Chair, Data Science Expert Committee of Drug Evaluation Committee, JPMA. I was involved in the expert working group of E8R1. The topic given to me was ICH E8R1. E8R1 is the first guideline effort in the GCP renovation, which is the strategic priority of ICH, and it will be followed by the revision of GCP. Today's program does not include GCP, so I'd like to talk a little bit about E6R3 as well. At first, I'd like to overview a history of ICH E6 and E8 towards GCP renovation. Until the early 1990s, clinical development of drugs basically involved clinical trials conducted in different countries. The rules for conducting clinical trials in each country and the environment for conducting trials differ greatly and transportation, communication, and information technology were not comparable to what they are today. The differences in regulatory requirements were greatly improved by ICH, which began in 1990. The agreement on GCP ICH E6 in 1996 laid the foundation for the international interoperability of clinical trial data that is still in place today. Just one month after the initial agreement on the GCP, a minor editorial amendment was made, which was designated E6R1 and was implemented and used for the next 20 years. In 1997, the year after the original GCP, the original E8 general considerations for clinical trials was agreed. In the mid to late 1990s, other important guidelines were agreed upon that brought not only common regulations, but also the common way of thinking, such as the standard for the reporting of safety information, ICHG2, International Terminology for Drugs, ICHM2, MEDRA, the Common Technical Document, ICHM4, Bridging Strategy, ICHE5, and the Statistical Principle for Clinical Trials, E9. The ICH GCP has contributed great, greatly to ensuring the scientific and ethical nature of clinical trials conducted around the world. The ICH GCP was amended in 2016 as E6R2. E6R2 added the perspective of increasing the efficiency of the conduct of clinical trials, taking into account the increasing digitalization of data and the increasing complexity of trial designs without compromising the ability to ensure scientific and ethical integrity. The amenda, amenda to Chapter 5 in ICH E6R2 describing the responsibility of sponsors recommended implementing a quality management system and using risk-based approach. E6R2 brought about uh, big changes in the practice when we conduct clinical trials, but it was only the preface of the next major change. Just two months after E6R2 was agreed in January 2016, 
a reflection paper outlining the overall vision and direction of GCP renovation was endorsed by ICH Assembly. The GCP renovation includes both the modernization of the E8 guideline and the subsequent renewal of GCP E6R3. E8R1 was the first guideline default and reached step 4 in October of this year. I was involved in the E8R1 expert working group. The direct trigger for the GCP renovation was a letter to ICH from an external stakeholders. The letter was sent from five research organizations, 119 health researchers in 22 countries, two EMA and ICH headquarters during the public consultation period of draft E6R2. The key points of the letter are perspectives lacking in GCP as follows. Lack of focus on issues most critical for trial quality. This means that instead of trying to ensure high quality in every aspect of a clinical trial, more explicit recommendation should be made to focus on what is critical and to allocate resources appropriately. Second, lack of flexibility for different types of trials. This means that clinical trials are not limited to confirmatory clinical trials, but are conducted under various situations in the product life cycle. For example, clinical trials conducted in the early stages of development of a drug with a completely new mechanism of action and post-marketing clinical studies in which the efficacy and safety profiles are much better understood, have very different risks for the subjects participating in them. Flexibility uh, for clinical studies in different situations is lacking in the current GCP. GCP has too many must-do's. The third one is lack of involvement of external stakeholders in ICH processes. This means the ICH has regulatory and industry members and they develop the guidelines. However, researchers who are external to ICH and cannot be involved in the development of the guidelines are greatly affected. This slide shows the actions taken by ICH in response to the submitted letter. In June 2016, at the at the ICH response meeting, management committee members met with external stakeholders to discuss the issues outlined in their letter. The meeting con discussion is some concerns, concerns cited in the stakeholders letter could be addressed by considering the position of E6 within the broader context of the family of ICH guidelines. As an example, consideration of randomization and its impact on the quality of a trial's result is addressed in ICH E9. They agree on the need for flexibility and for emphasizing quality aspects in proportion to risks involved. And ICH made a commitment to involve external stakeholders in future. In fact, this promise has been put into action. In October 2019, as part of the GCP Renovation Plan, ICH held a public meeting entitled ICH Global Meeting on E8R1 Guideline. 
on general considerations for clinical trials, hosted by FDA at their headquarters. The purpose of the public meeting was to provide information and more importantly, to solicit input from broad range of non-ICH external stakeholders on the draft E8R1 guideline. The expert working group for E6R3 is now developing the draft guideline and they have opportunities to discuss with external stakeholders, representatives from several parties. This is the first time for ICH to hear from external stakeholders at the stage when the draft guideline is being prepared, that is, before the public consultation of the draft guideline. The reflection paper on GCP renovation published January 2017. The goal is to provide updated guidance that is flexible enough to address the increasing diversity of clinical trial design and data sources. That is appropriate for trials that support regulatory and other health policy decisions. That adheres to underlying principles of human subject protection and data quality. Public comments sought for reflection paper as first step to increase external stakeholder involvement in ICH processes. These are useful links related to GCP renovation. The first link is reflection paper. The second one is summary of the E6R3 stakeholder engagement approach. The third one is guideline pages for E8R1 and E6R3. The first step of GCP renovation is revision to ICH E8. E8 guideline originally agreed in 1997 is a high-level document that serves as a roadmap to other ICH guidelines. E8 focused on studies to support regulatory decisions. It did not address differences in trial design and conduct required for different types of studies. E8 did not address design or planning considerations for data quality, the quality of the study that generates the data. E8R1 revised and modernized to address broader concern about the principles of study design and planning for an appropriate level of data quality. E8R1 includes addition of the concept of quality by design as key consideration in study planning, particularly as it relates to non-standard data sources and non-traditional trial designs. The second step of GCP renovation is E6R3. E6R3 preserves a key role for the current focus on traditional interventional clinical trials, while also addressing a broader range of study types and data sources. E6R3 retains the current focus on good clinical investigative site practices, while also referring to E8R1 discussion of study quality considerations and other ICH guidance documents. Propose ex development of series of annexes with detail on particular study types or data sources. This slide illustrates the components of E6R3. Due to the wide impact of this important guideline, 
the ICH Management Committee has taken specific steps to keep the public informed on the status of the work by sharing publicly the, the EWG progress and engaging academic investigators as well as patients and trial participants in various ways during the guideline development process. ICH E6R3 will consist of the overarching principles and two annexes that together are intended to be responsible across clinical trial types and settings and relevant as clinical research and associated technologies and methodologies advance. The principles and Annex 1 will reflect and replace the content and the scope of the current ICH E6R2. Work on Annex 2 will proceed after Annex 1 is released for public consultation and will provide additional considerations for non-traditional trials. Together, these materials will represent ICH E6R3. Let's move on to the ICH E8R1 guideline. E8R1 is a high-level guideline and no organization may pro prepare SOPs based on E8R1 only. However, E8R1 describes the philosophy of the product life cycle from the development stage to post-marketing. And this philosophy will be inherited by E6R3. And E8R1 will be referenced when other guidelines are revised in future or new ones are developed. Although it has been 24 years since the original E8 was issued, we believe that E8R1 is now a guideline that will not become out of date over the next 10 or 20 years. What has changed in E8R1? This diagram was included in the original E8 and I'm sure you are familiar with it. The horizontal axis of this diagram was the phase of development, but this has been expanded to the entire product life cycle. In addition, the components of this diagram now include not only clinical trials, but also observational studies and various research designs and data sources. In this way, the scope of E8 and E6 has been expanded. What has changed? The title of the guideline has also changed. The title of the original E8 was General Considerations for Clinical Trials, but the title of E8R1 has been changed to General Considerations for Clinical Studies. The Chapter 1 of E8R1 Objectives of this document gives this explanation. For the purpose of this document, a clinical study is meant to refer to a study of one or more medicinal products in humans conducted at any point in a product life cycle, both prior to and following marketing consolidation. The focus is on clinical studies to support regulatory decisions, recognizing these studies may also inform health policy decisions, clinical practice guidelines, or other actions. Regulatory decisions are not only to the marketing approval of a drug, but also include various post-marketing decisions made under the regulations of each country. When E8R1 was being developed, it was recognized that there is an inconsistency in terminology among the ICH guidelines. The term 
clinical study was used in ICHG3, E4, and E5. E3 states clinical study report. E4 states dose response study. E5 states bridging study. On the other hand, the term clinical trial was used in E6, E9, E10, and E17. In E1 guideline and original E8 guideline, both clinical study and clinical trial were used. All of these terms were basically used to describe interventional clinical trials. In E8R1, we redefined the terms that had been found to be inconsistent. This is the definition of clinical study and clinical trial published by clinicaltrials.gov. It states, a clinical study involves research using human volunteers, also called participants, that is intended to add to medical knowledge. There are two main types of clinical studies, clinical trials, also called interventional studies, and observational studies. Clinicaltrials.gov includes both interventional and observational studies. The definition of E8R1 is exactly the same as this definition. What has changed in E8R1? Reflection of patient's voice on the drug development and the individual study was explicitly stated. Chapter 2.3, patient input into drug development states, consulting with patients and or patient organization during drug development can help to ensure that patients' perspectives are captured. The views of patients or of their caregivers, parents, can be variable throughout all phases of drug de development. Involving patients early in the design of the study is likely to increase trust in the study, facilitate recruitment, and promote adherence. Patients also provide their perspectives of living with a condition which may contribute to the determination, for example, of endpoints that are meaningful to patients, selection of the, of the appropriate population and the duration of the study, and the use of acceptable comparators. This ultimately supports the development of drugs that are better tailored to patients' needs. This concept is not new and patient centricity, patient centricity or patient-centered medicine is increasingly being discussed in countries around the world. And patient groups are participating in ICH as external stakeholder. ICH is considering now patient-focused drug development. The reflection paper on patient-focused drug development PFDD was endorsed by Assembly in November of last year and was published on the ICH and other ICH regulators' websites for public consultation after March of this year. As a result of this public consultation, the reflection paper was revised and endorsed by the Assembly in June of this year and can be downloaded from ICH website. What has changed in E8R1? E8R1 added Chapter 3, Designing Quality into Clinical Studies. Such a chapter was not in the original E8. Quality by design is a key concept in the GCP renovation and will have a significant impact on people who are involved in the conduct of clinical studies. Therefore, I'd like to explain this part in some detail. 
E8R1 defines quality like the upper part of this slide. Quality of a clinical study is considered in this document as fitness for purpose. The purpose of a clinical study is to generate reliable information to answer the research questions and support decision making while protecting study participants. The quality of the information generated should therefore be sufficient to support good decision making. There is a lot of data and processes in a clinical study, and some of the data and the processes must be critical in order to be fit for purpose. There are also other non-critical data and processes. The new GCP focuses on quality of critical data and processes. EHR1 also states appropriately allocate resources according to the criticality of the data and processes and according to the risks. In the chapter 3.2, EHR1 states like the lower part of this slide, perfection in every aspect of an activity is rarely achievable or can only be achieved by use of resources that are out of proportion to the benefit of them. The quality factors should be prioritized to identify those that are critical to the study at the time of the study design and study procedures should be proportionate to the risks inherent in the study and the importance of the information collected. The critical to quality factors should be clear and should not be cluttered with minor issues. For example, due to extensive secondary objectives or processes, data collection not linked to the proper protection of the study participants and or primary study objectives. Critical to quality factor is another key concept in the new GCP and this term is sometimes abbreviated as CTQ factor. Chapter 3.2 states like this, a basic set of factors relevant to ensuring study quality should be identified for each study. Emphasis should be given to those factors that stand out as critical to study quality. These critical to quality factors are attributes of a study whose integrity is fundamental to the protection of study participants, the reliability and the interpretability of the study results, and the decisions made based on the study results. These quality factors are considered to be critical because if their integrity were to be undermined by errors of design or conduct, the reliability or ethics of decision making based on the results of the study would also be undermined. Critical to quality factors should also be considered holistically so that dependencies among them can be identified. In the previous slide, in the explanation of QTC factor, the term integrity was used. Integrity was many different meanings and there is no corresponding Japanese word. How about Korean language? Merriam-Webster English Dictionary explains like this. First, firm adherence to a code of especially moral or artistic values, incorruptibility. What is important in our context is second and third one. Second, an un unimpaired condition, soundness. Un impaired 
means that quality or function is not damaged or not made weaker. Third, the quality or state of being complete or undivided, completeness. In Japan, completeness is often used as a Japanese translation of integrity. But completeness captures only one aspect of integrity. How about Korean language? The expert working group for original D6 and E9 have discussed about integrity. This story is based on my personal communication. They said that they thought integrity is keep it as it is or make every effort to keep it as it is. They regarded the integrity as a concept, including how to maintain integrity. In other words, integrity means keeping the data as is, without altering any data included in the process, from the data generation to the final report. Of course, fabrication and the falsification are outrageous. These will destroy integrity completely. Now let me explain the most important concept I want to share with you today, quality by design. The chapter 3 of E8R1, designing quality into clinical study states like this. The quality by design approach to clinical research involves focusing on critical to quality factors to ensure the protection of the rights, safety, and well-being of study participants, the generation of reliable and meaningful results, and the management of risks to those factors using a risk proportionate approach. The approach is supported by the establishment of an appropriate framework for the identification and review of critical to quality factors at the time of design and planning of the study and throughout its conduct, analysis, and reporting. What does this mean? To put it simply, E8R1 highly recommends that the, the approach to ensuring quality be shifted from retrospective to prospective. This is very important for us. No, no, this is critical for us. Before discussing quality by design in clinical studies, I'd like to look back at the history of quality management in Japan, which has developed mainly in the field of industrial production. In the early days of quality management, the main focus was on strict shipping and receiving inspections or testing to prevent defective products from being delivered to customers and to reject defective products that had already been produced. It can be said that post-production inspection or testing was the core of quality management. Gradually, however, it became clear that if defective products could not be produced, then post hoc quality check was a waste of money. The idea that good quality is not created by post hoc quality check, but by a good process came to the fore, and companies were polarized into two groups. One is companies that moved forward no post hoc quality check, and second, companies that continue to check all products. The most anticipated activity to eliminate the post hoc quality check was process control. Process control will be explained in the next slide. 
By 1970, the quality of Japanese products and the process capability, that is, the, the ability to build quality into the process, had improved significantly. And the defect rate began to be discussed in unit of PPM. Finally, this trend had led to the concept of quality by design. Process control has become the norm and mainstream of quality management has moved to design, which is further upstream than process control. Going back to our field, clinical study, for a long time we have heavily relied on post hoc quality checks to ensure quality. Risk-based monitoring is now being implemented partly due to the recommendations by the current E6R2. If we apply our situation to the history of quality management, we can say that we are getting, we are getting out of retrospective quality checks and process control is gradually spreading. Quality by design is a more advanced approach and GCP renovation is trying to encourage such an advanced approach. This slide shows the scenario of process control. The first step is to create a process that is less likely to produce defective products. In our context, defective products are some products during a clinical study. This is the part where we do risk assessment and take preventive actions. Even if we take preventive actions, we cannot prevent the issue that we did not anticipate in advance. So even if we try our best to take preventive actions, problems may still occur. If a problem occurs, there must be one or more causes that should not be overlooked. This is called assignable causes. If the causes are eliminated, our process will become more and more stable. In this way, the process capability of the organization, that is, the ability to build quality into their processes, will improve. Process control is to work in accordance with such a scenario. This is my opinion. GCP describes implementation of quality management system as a sponsor's responsibility. In fact, this is also the case with the current E6R2. However, I think there is a big missing piece in GCP. That is a voluntary activity at site to build quality into critical data and processes. Now we understand that we should identify risks and take preventive actions before starting a clinical trial. We divide risks into three categories. The first category is a risk that is not specific to a protocol and is always present in clinical trials using the same drug. The second one is a protocol specific risk. The third one is a site specific risk. The first and the second risks can occur at any site. The preventive actions are training for all sites and dissemination of how to prevent to all sites through communication tools. For example, protocol, EDC, com completion guideline, etc. Problems are likely to arise when the protocol requires procedures that differ from the site's usual workflow. Actions taken 
to prevent them may vary from site to site. Only those who are familiar with the site's workflow can reach truly meaningful and effective preventive actions. However, there are things you should be doing on a daily basis. It's too late to start identifying risks and considering taking preventive actions until you see the protocol. You may not be ready in time for first patient in. Haste may lead to inadequate risk identification and preventive actions. In order to avoid this, it is crucial that sites voluntarily build quality into their processes between quality before first looking at the protocol. Regardless of the protocol, there will always be important data and important processes. For example, informed consent is a critical process. Measuring or observing primary variables is critical. SAE reporting process ensuring important eligibility criteria, care and or follow-up after SAE or clinically significant adverse event, etc. Critical data includes primary variables, covariates for primary variables, information related to SAE, clinical significant adverse events, or adverse events of special interest, etc. This process and data are common to most protocols. Sites should voluntarily build into build quality into their processes. Suppose there are 20 staffs engaged in clinical study at a site. When can they say that quality is built into their process? That is a case where all 20 staffs have a common understanding of a certain process and they can take an action in a common manner. If each staff acts in a different way or in a different order, preferable quality management is not in place at the site. Their quality management depends on individual and it does not mean that the site has high process capability. On the other hand, a site that is familiar with building quality into their processes will be able to efficiently detect risks specific to a new protocol and take preventive actions to address those risks. Such a site can quickly implement identifying risks and taking preventive actions. Thus, it is an additional necessary preventive actions to take in the preparation phase of a given protocol. The activities of building quality cannot be done all at once. We have to build up one by one. Those activities are also called Kaizen activity. Kaizen is a Japanese word, but it has become a global term in quality management. Kaizen means continuous improvement day by day. Let's start with one process, wherever it may be. Gather all concerned people and share the problem or risks. Analyze the root cause of the problem or risk. Propose preventive actions and try to implement them together. Click. Check if the preventive actions work. This is one cycle of Kaizen activity. Do the same for the second problem or risk. We will do the same with the third problem or risk. The third first cycle may take a long time, but as you go through it, Everyone gets to know how to do it, and the activity becomes more efficient. This is exactly what process management 
is all about. If a site is familiar with process control, it will be able to respond quickly to pro protocol specific risks. Whether it is risk based monitoring or quality by design in GCP renovation, four sites where process control is deeply rooted. They need not change and be afraid of anything. Basically, ICH GCP will directly affect the sponsor's quality management. However, I think it is likely that quality by design approach will lead to a bad scenario. The worst case scenario around 2024, when the new E6R3 is implemented in many countries, is elimination of sites that have not built quality into their processes. I think it will happen around 2024. Sponsor will say, this protocol follows the new GCP and apply the principle of quality by design. And what efforts have been made at your site to build quality into the processes involved in clinical trial? The timing of E6R3 step 5 in each country may be important, but in MRCT, multi-regional clinical trials, I think it will become visible after step 5 in the US and Europe. Building up the next two years is very important. Sites that continue Kaizen activities to building quality to their processes will become highly skilled problem solvers by 2024. Such sites will be able to take preventive actions on protocol-specific processes in a short time. Such a site will be recognized as a good partner for quality by design and will be very much in mind and second to none in the world. On the other hand, sites that continue with their old style practices which depends on retrospective quality checking. If they continue with the old style practices for two years from now, may be excluded from global development. Impact on global development. So far, global development has focused on cost reduction or efficiency and the number of participating countries and sites has been expanded. Some countries and sites were not familiar with the clinical research. The shift to, shift to quality by design brought by GCP innovation may lead to the selection of sites that have the ability to build quality into their processes. Please note that this is not a competition among countries, but a competition among sites around the world. I'd like to summarize my presentation. First, in ICH, GCP renovation is in progress. The first guideline effort, E8R1, reached step four, and the second one, E6R3 is <coughs> ongoing. Due to the wide impact of the GCP, the ICH Management Committee has taken specific steps to keep the public informed in the status of the work by sharing publicly the EWG, EWG, EWG progress and engaging academic investigators as well as patients and the trial participants in various ways during the guideline development process. 
The major changes in GCP renovation are reflection of patient's voice on the drug development and individual study was explicitly st stated. Expanding the scope of GCP. Addition of the concept of quality by design as key consideration in study planning. The biggest impact for people involved in the conduct of clinical study is the shift from a backward looking to the forward looking approach to ensuring quality. This may lead to many changes. Finally, I'd like to say you may be anxious and concerned, but let's create a future together with a positive mindset that enjoys change. Thank you for your attention.